Matt, is it useful that I have the webcam on? Uh, okay, we're, go to I meeting. think we're good. We're good. We're good to go. All right, we going? Yeah. Okay, I will start the recording. Uh, no okay, well, yeah, are we're... Using, are you doing that camera or are you doing the web camera? Uh, that one? I'm not going to use a whiteboard. Okay. And if well, I'm speaking, it'll be odd to have your face on there and me speaking. That's a good point. Okay. That's, yeah. yeah, that's a good point. You stick out the big one. Okay. So, okay, you guys in chat can hear me. And yeah, they can't right that. now. So is some is anybody watching this? Because I just my computer just crashed. <laughs> I'm gonna. You had it there. So I can't. You're right. I have it. I have it on. No, I, just, okay, I, I have it on GoToMeeting. I, I bet. I bet it's not gonna let me use it. You can see it here. One second. Figure this out. Ten seconds. Yeah, we'll figure out the logistics. I'm just gonna kind of sort of watch and take notes and. Camera. Webcam. Hopefully there we this go. will work out. All this, right. This is very and intense. recording. Okay, so uh, it's going to be a short meeting because Subutai is not here. You can hear and, that too, right? uh, and the topic I have is not very interesting. Well, it's interesting, but not very deep. So uh, when when Florian was here on Thursday, we, we reviewed this paper, the Working Memory 2.0 paper. And um, I thought it was pretty interesting, his topic. And it, but it was built around these gamma frequencies. You know, just remember, and so they're, they're using the gamma frequency for uh, refreshing this temporary memory. And um, then, but when reading this paper, I, I found a whole bunch of what looked like very interesting references to other oscillatory things. And so I said, oh, there's a whole, you know, because in my, in my mind, the oscillations have always been this sort of like weird, people studied them for like going back, you know, 40 years ago because they, you know, they found these oscillations just using, you know, scalp recordings, you know. Um, yeah, but it was never that. like, what are, what are they for? And so there's always been this one hypothesis that they could be just there to synchronize uh, spikes so that neurons work better, but maybe they do something else too. So here we use, Florian came in with a very concrete example of doing something else, which is using this, the, these gamma frequencies for um, recording short-term memories. I thought it was very compelling. And then there was all these other papers and it became clear that there'd been a lot of research done on oscillations in the last 10, uh, 15 years, uh, and I hadn't really looked at any of that stuff. And so they looked interesting. The title looks really interesting. So I went and printed a bunch of those papers, and I read them this weekend. I read several of them. Um, I was a little disappointed overall. That is, they sounded really promising, um, and they were interesting, but not as interesting as I thought they would be. Uh, and so here's here's one. This is a 2010 paper in uh, current of neurobiology, dynamics of active sensing and perceptual selection. And even here in the introduction, they talk about active sensing, which is, you know, moving and, and they're going to talk about the role of uh, frequencies and oscillations in active sensing. But they say, oh, it's obvious that active sensing in like the things like the bat, you know, which sends out its ping, but, you know, in consistent contrast, biological sensors like the eyes and fingertips have traditionally been thought of as passive sensors. And I'm like, really? Even in 2010, people are thinking like, you know, eyes and fingers are just passive. So it's like, okay, so they're just like moving beyond that. They're trying to show, no, these are really active sensors. Okay, so that was too. This paper here, this one's called Perceptual Cycles from Cell Press. This was a 2016 paper by Rufin Van Rulen. It was a review, which is always nice. Um, and in this paper, it's called Perceptual Cycles. Um, he gets it first. He gets to this figure here. I'm just going to share with you guys with a small. You might want to come around this way. Uh, this figure here, figure one. Um, he's basically there's this two sort of basic ideas that people are thinking about. One is on the left, which is a rhythmic perception, meaning like you're representing something, but at the peak of the oscillations, more neurons are firing than other times, and therefore it synchronizes them. But it's not really doing anything else other than that. That's just like the plumbing idea. Like we're just trying to get the cells to fire at the same time. And the alternate idea is that actually no, that, that the it, it's not like those neurons are just being getting the force. There's actually periods of time when one one thing is being done and periods of time where something else might be done. It's like so it's not a continuous thing. It's a discrete perception, even though you might not be aware of it uh, consciously. But the idea that there's these little windows in which something is being calculated and the other windows are on the other part of the phase where something isn't being calculated. And so a large part of this paper is making the argument that it's more of the latter, that this is what's happening here. And then, of course, the first time um, 
that at least I was aware that that's something would be calculating on different parts, and they mentioned that in here is the uh, precession in the, uh, the, the mental, uh, hippocampal complex, where you can show the different time frames, different cell populations are firing. So a lot of this is just sort of talking about the basics. These papers are like, oh, what is it? Is it like this or is it like this? And it's more like this, and maybe maybe there's other computations going on in the middle of all of this. Um, and, and these papers are complex and hard to read. Um, so there's a hell of a lot more detail in here, um, but uh, I'm not going to try to summarize it because I didn't get into it. And then um, this is um, this paper here. This is a uh, 2010 paper, uh, Bushman and Miller again. Miller was on that working memory paper. Um, and it's called Shifting the Spotlight of Attention, Evidence for Discrete Computations in Cognition. So this is like going beyond the one I just talked there, which is saying like um, uh, maybe during, um, uh, that during attention, that the tension is tied to these different oscillations, and there might be different comp computations going on at different points in the attentional cycle. And one of the ideas there is that is, is like, oh, when I'm attending to something, the attentional aspect is happening in one part of the cycle, and then maybe I'm doing something that's not attended on the other aspect of the cycle, which we've talked about is maybe a really cool idea for uh, how we could do displacements that you might actually be alternating between an attended object and a non attended object, an attended object and a non attended object on every single cycle. And therefore, you could, you could calculate, you know, over and over again, you could be calculating the displacements um, uh, as you're doing that. And um, Let's see here. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to read here. This, again, our cognitive computations um, discrete, and they're arguing that they are. Um, they're arguing that you can hold two multiple objects in, in memory at the same time, attended object and non-attended object. So I'm not going to go through all the details of this, um, uh, but in some sense they're arguing for that what we found in the hippocampus with the precession, something equivalent would be likely happening in the cortex. Um, and um, but it's it, they get they don't get too far. I mean, he says, what purpose might these discrete computations serve? You know, we name the kind of you know it's not it's not like a very well formed theory. I mean, even I added more to it than they say here. It's basically like well, you could be doing multiple things at the same time. Uh, and they kind of speculate what those might be. Um, and they, they also point out here that they, they're, although they're proposing this is common throughout the neocortex, they, don't, they also say it doesn't require all computations of the brain to be discrete like this. So some may not be discrete, some may be discrete. So, so I found that these particular examples they gave are very difficult to follow. Uh, it would require much closer reading. Um, and, but I took, I just accepted their conclusion. Their conclusion is that we have these discrete time frames that we can calculate different things at different points in time. Um, and I thought that that is a whole new perspective that we've kind of been working away there by accepting the procession in the, in the hippocampus. Um, and now there's a bunch of people arguing the same thing happening throughout the neocortex, even if they don't have good theories for why or what it's doing. And then uh, this last paper I read here was a 2018 paper, August, that this came out. Um, and it's talking about spatial attention. Um, and and it's, let me see if I can kind of summarize it again. Um, here's one sentence. It says, can, this, is a, this is by Frank and Fulton I don't know any of these people because it's a different field. Uh, dynamic interplay with the frontal mm -hmm. parietal network underlies rhythmic spatial attention. Um, it says converging evidence indicates environmental sampling, whether through covert or overt mechanisms, is a fundamentally rhythmic process with a sampling rate in the theta band. So again, more evidence that these these cycles are occurring between different parts of the neocortex, and that attention is occurring on the cycles. And they have these very, they have these very specific uh, attentional paradigms that monkeys can do. Um, that they that they test for, and it's pretty damn complicated. Um, but in the end, we're basically just trying to show that many of these operations are tied to rhythm, that the saccades initiate at a certain point in a rhythmic cycle, um, and, and a whole bunch of things that are tied to these rhythms. But not a, what I was a little disappointed was it wasn't like a, a more cogent theory about 
how tie all this together. That's that's the thing I was missing. It's more like, hey, this stuff is happening, and these are active senses. There's these cycles going on. Attention is tied to these cycles. Movements are tied to these cycles. Maybe there's multiple things being represented at the same time during these cycles. This is happening in the near cortex. Um, and all the, the, the much more detailed parts of the paper seem to be um, not illuminating uh, deeper insights, but more sort of supporting those conclusions. So um, I think it's, it's interesting and it opens up a whole series of possibilities for us. And there's a ton more literature out there if we wanted to read them. Although I was reading some very recent papers and those recent papers didn't, didn't say, ha, ah, we figured this all out. Here's what's going on. You know, it's like, no, nope, it's an interesting area to study and there's lots of evidence suggesting it. So from that point of view, I was a little disappointed. Uh, but you know these are hard studies and people work on for years now and and it's it certainly is advanced beyond what I looked at the last time I looked at this 20 years ago so so that's my report on those papers. <laughs> yeah. So one general question I have on oscillations and I'm not sure if this is known um, because I've mostly I've mostly only read about oscillations like uh, by reading other things that mention them and then that I read a little bit but I haven't dived head first into them so. Uh, what confuses me with them a little bit is, um, are they a cause or are they an effect? Because uh, one way you could get an oscillation in local field potentials or a noticeable oscillation is, suppose there is a large population of cells that's firing at 40 hertz. Yeah. Like suppose, suppose a working memory uh, is held by uh, at certain times, um, at certain times periodically there are cells firing at 40 hertz. That could cause the oscillation that you detect. I mean, the if, if you, well, I mean, if, I, if you're just measuring local field potential and yeah. then suddenly a large population of cells starts spiking at 40 hertz. Well, why do they, oh, but the question is, uh, why this, I'm, I'm confused by your comment. Is it, why, are they, I mean, they for them to spike together, there has to be some sort of underlying mechanism to make them spike together, right? Yes. So are you suggesting that uh, I'm confused. I, I don't know if, okay, explanation A. Yeah. Uh, so when you're holding in a memory uh, or when you need to refresh a memory to cause it to stay, you need, when you need to cause a bunch of cells to burst in order to preserve a memory, uh, your brain somehow ramps up gamma. Yeah. Um, it causes basically every cell to be receiving kind of this oscillating input that causes every cell to fire more often. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what gamma is. It's something that the brain can ramp up and down. Yeah. Explanation B, uh, when you, uh, some neural mechanism exists mm -hmm. that causes cells to occasionally fire at about 40 hertz. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can be detected in the local field potential as a gamma oscillation. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know with, like, there's a, well, I'm it's, switching it's, up causes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if you think if they're firing, if they're firing synchronously at 40 hertz, uh, wouldn't it more indicate the former than the latter? I mean, um, probably. Yeah. yeah. I think the attitude. I mean, it's an interesting question. The attitude in these papers, I, they, it comes across as they're all thinking of the former. It's like the oscillations are a means by which the brain decides I'm going to attend to something. I now establish a, um, an oscillatory frequency, uh, or I'm going to these two regions of the neocortex are going to talk to each other. Um, and that's the way they describe it. It's an interesting question. Maybe it's more of an epiphenomenon that, that comes about for other reasons. Um, I think that's what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think the big thing for me, though, the, you know, all is I could, from an information point of view, it was never clear to me oscillations were essential if they're really just providing this sort of synchrony thing. You know, okay, we need to get the neurons part together. That's part of the plumbing. But the fact that they're right now where we've got these multiple things going on in the same phase, that's a very interesting computational problem issue. And that introduces, and that we kind of we kind of worked away there already. We in our sequence when we already talked about, hey, you know, we could be learning and inferring on the two different cycles, uh, two different phases, uh, and that would solve a lot of problems. So, so that was like that was a big insight. And now. Um, thinking about displacement cells, this could really play a big role in that kind of thing. And all of a sudden, we can start thinking about how do I get two representations alternating back and forth, and then I can compute between them and things like that. So that, that all of a sudden, when we start thinking about multiple things happening on the same on different phases, it's like, oh wow, that's like a whole other information processing realm. Um, I don't know how that relates to your question, 
Marcus, it seems to me, um, it seems to me this oscillation then becomes this more fundamental information processing capability, and therefore the brain is going to actively make them happen. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, somebody's talked about that. You know, there's some theories in here just like, oh, okay, if you have an inhibitory cell and a positive, you know, an excitatory cell and hooked up in a certain way, you get oscillation. Um, but mostly, I think these papers were just sort of trying to make an argument that that they are occurring in the neocortex and that they are they're they mean they're meaningful um, and uh, related to things that we know that animals certain animals can do. Yeah. Anyway, there's a whole slew of literature on this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, my reading of it today and this weekend sort of implies that. If I spent a lot of time reading it, I would only get a slightly incremental knowledge beyond what if I'm reading papers from like the August last year and it's still talking about sort of basics, it's like, oh, it, 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 it's moving into the neocortex, but it's not really super like super well um, understood yet. Um, and I'm guessing a lot of this is just the fact that um, our measurement tools we have um, Oscillations are a really convenient thing to measure. Uh, you just like you're you're using EEG or any of these types of um, these types of uh, recording tools, and then you just what perform a Fourier decomposition yeah. on it, and like there you you have yeah. you have you have the signal. So it's kind of an easy thing to measure, and that would cause yeah. But the problem is what they're trying to do now, though, to understand all this other stuff. So you have to look at single cell or multi cell recordings. Yeah, you know, because they're going to look at different phases. Like what's the population code at this point, and what's the population code at this point. So all of these studies, I think, I think I should go back and look. I think all of them, or most of them, were like monkey, macaque, multi-unit recording, mm -hmm. and maybe some were human. I can't remember. Um, but multi-unit recording, and um, you know, getting more underneath the covers of it, like oh, because because you, it's really. I mean, think about it. You could have this this EEG recording, which is oh, 40 hertz or 15 hertz, or whatever it is. And then, but it really could be individual cell populations going on off at different times. It's like, uh, I mean, I thought I thought Florian's presentation last week was pretty convincing. Um, where you know, he's like, oh, it seems like they really did nail down this this short term memory thing. Really believable. Mm -hmm. um, and that was like, oh, that's a level of depth. That's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so it's a whole other. Um, like we've been kind of working away in this area anyway. We've been trying to think about how these things can impact our models. Um, and I just think it's more evidence that, okay, this is another tool in the brains, in the, in the cortex's toolkit for representation and calculations between representations. Um, so, anyway, I'm not going to read any more of these papers <laughs> at this point in time, unless, um, no, it's good. Diminishing returns. That's all I got for today. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, I don't have anything. All right. Max? Nope. All right. We're going to call it quits for the. Yeah, I'll take it back. Okay, thank you. You're not part yet. It's a long react go. time. <laughs> Here it goes. Okay, thanks. All right. Okay. You have like a key indicator? Let me turn this off. Okay. Yeah, Matt, you're still in the GoTo meeting. I'm going to turn this off, though. Yeah, I was trying to get off. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Close. All right. There you go. So that's, um, that's a research meeting. Um, that was pretty quick. They're usually a little bit longer than that, but uh, it really depends. It's all, you guys can hear me? Okay. <laughs> it really depends on um, uh, who's got topics and who wants to talk about what. Sometimes these things will go on two hours. They'll, go, they'll come back after lunch and continue it, or it'll go into lunch. Uh, so it really just depends. Um, so this was just like a one sample into them into research meetings, and I'll just keep streaming them uh, and uh, give you guys some context into what's going on at Nementa. Uh, sound is low. I know why the sound's low. How's that? That's better. Um, so thanks for joining in. Does anybody have any questions about what you just saw? Um, I'm, I'm happy to stick around and answer questions. This is just want to. Whoops, I didn't spell it right. Maybe if this helps anybody. Um, we just are. We're done with the meeting now. Uh, it was 
they were talking about oscillations in uh, neocortex. There wasn't a whole lot of mention of thalamus. It was, a, it was sort of assumed, and I thought it was interesting, the idea of our oscillations cause or effect. I think they have to be both, right? They, oscillations have to be caused by uh, something, and then they probably cause other things. I mean, that's it's a part of the compute process in, in the brain. Um, so, so, so yeah, I think, I think the general idea is that gamma oscillations in the neocortex are, are suspected to be caused by the thalamus, although, I mean, there's still a lot to be learned. It, it, the hard thing is experimenting. Um, it's hard to find <laughs> willing subjects um, because, you know, you have to open up their brains and put probes <laughs> right down in there. Um, and, uh, you know, the, there's ethical concerns with that. So we try and do as much as we can with fMRI, which is an unobtrusive way of monitoring neurons. But it's very hard to tell the connections, you, you, uh, the directions of the connections and the, um, it's because uh, there's, there's breakthroughs happening right now. So I can't really speak to what the breakthroughs are, but typically it's a measure of blood flow. And what we really want is a measure of voltage in it's very, very particularly localized areas of the brain, so we can, um, you know, focus on specific areas and what the, those neurons populations are doing. Um, so anyway, uh, he, that's it. Um, so I'm gonna log off, and I've got another meeting. Um, well, I'll tell you what. Since we're since we're on Twitch, we'll do we'll we'll go raid somebody. Since I got some some uh i got some followers if you guys want to raid somebody let's do it let's see who's who's streaming right now who haven't i raided yet this code and joy guy that was this is it's this guy's birthday we could raid him um let's do code and joy uh i watched i watched him a little bit the other day oh he's playing a game i don't i'm not i don't usually raid games who's this guy siege Siege Games. Oh yeah, I was watching him earlier. I, I enjoyed that. I said, let's read him. Uh, okay, here we go. Didn't see any more questions, so we're gonna get on with this. And, uh, oh, I think that worked. Did that work? There should be a, yeah. So we're gonna raid this guy. Thank you for watching. I'll be back at one o'clock today uh, with an AI chat. We're gonna talk about pooling. Um, different types of pooling, pooling like in CNNs and um, pooling um, in uh, spatial, like spatial pooling, temporal pooling, those ideas too. So let's rate them. Bye.